Hello everyone, my name is Kim Thompson. I am the director of Seafood for the Future at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. We are a nonprofit ocean conservation institution. We are the fourth largest aquarium in the US in terms of visitorship. So we see about 1.7 million visitors annually. In addition to our exhibits and our cute and fuzzy critters and our colorful critters, we really spend a lot of time trying to engage the public and educate them about the relationship that we as human beings have with the ocean and the planet. And more importantly, how we meet the needs of a growing population in a changing climate while also reducing our environmental impacts. And one of the potential pieces of the solution that we feature both at the aquarium through exhibits and on-site education, but also through broader stakeholder engagement and dialogue and outreach and education is responsible marine aquaculture. So as I've begun to touch upon, why do we support marine aquaculture? Well, as we know, marine aquaculture and seafood in general can be produced with fewer greenhouse gas emissions relative to other animal proteins, including beef, which the U.S. is one of the largest consumers of. It also uses less fresh water and it can provide great nutritional benefits it's among one of the healthiest, most nutritious proteins on the planet. We also have an ethical responsibility to take on some of the responsibility for the risks of our own consumption. The U.S. consumes more meat per capita than any other nation. Seafood accounts for just 7% of our per capita meat consumption. Meanwhile, red meat, which we know is one of the most resource intensive forms of animal protein, uh, accounts for about 50% of our per capita consumption. We also import more seafood by value than any other nation. So we're clearly relying on other nations to produce our seafood for us, um, despite the fact that we have probably some of the greatest potential in our own exclusive economic zone in terms of ecological and regulatory potential to produce more seafood um, in a more responsible way. And then of course, with US aquaculture production accounts for less than 1% of the global seafood supply. So beyond just the direct environmental risks and benefits, we also need to look at the ethical ramifications of you know, the risks that we're willing to take in our own backyard and then how then we can reduce those risks. And responsible seafood can allow us to account for more of our own protein consumption with fewer risks and greater benefits. As my boss, Dr. Sherry Schubel likes to say, marine aquaculture may not be the silver bullet, but it might just be the silver buckshot that we need. So it's clear that we need to increase our domestic seafood supply, but what is it that's stopping us? Well, we know that we have, and research has shown that we have the, the bones, the regulatory and legal infrastructure to responsibly manage marine aquaculture. In fact, we have some of the strongest environmental regulations on the planet. It's not to say they aren't without need for improvement as anything can be improved, especially over time as society grows and changes. Um, Generally speaking, we do have a very strong framework of environmental regulations, including the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. These all apply along with a whole slew of alphabet soup of regulations all apply to marine aquaculture in the U.S. Where the U.S. perhaps falls a little short is how we coordinate and execute these laws specifically for marine aquaculture. And so what we're really missing here is not the laws and the regulations themselves. What we're missing is a, a, a mandate to provide more consistent application of these laws across the board, which would require stronger interagency collaboration. Um, but we're not here to talk about the legal framework today. What we're really here to talk about is one of the second obstacles that really hinders marine aquaculture development, not just in the U.S., but in developed countries uh, in general, which is poor perceptions or lack of social license. So what is social license? First, a few things that it's important to point out is, first of all, there is no one single definition for social license. So this may vary depending on what publication you're looking at. It's also important to understand that 
this is a, a loaded term. Not everybody accepts it. And not everybody accepts that it should be applied to the blue economy or marine aquaculture or conservation. So um, keeping in mind that for the purpose of this talk, we are going to stick to social license as a, a framework to, to look at, a lens to look at. Um, but it, it is not without its own challenges. Um, social license was originally coined for uh, looking at social interactions with mining. Um, it has since been also looked at for the blue economy globally, um, and also more recently it has been looked at for marine aquaculture development. Um, the EU is certainly much further along than we are in terms of looking at perceptions in marine aquaculture, but Canada has um, also some pretty strong programming on this in the U.S. is um, just starting to play catch up in terms of research in this area. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to look at social license as the implied permission that communities and societies may grant for activities that may take place in or may affect shared resources in areas such as the ocean. It's important to understand about social license that it is earned and maintained over time. Poor perceptions tend to be associated with a lack of knowledge about an important sector. This is really important because you can imagine how if people don't understand something or they haven't really been introduced to it, it's going to be much easier to influence with the negative information that they see. So, for example, we know that the, the national media coverage is tending to sway toward the more negative information, usually because it's sexy, right? It's it's timely, it's something that happened, it gets great headlines. So if you hear about these escapes or a chemical spill or, you know, disease outbreak, um, and that's what the public is introduced to. So without something else to compare it to, without understanding anything else, this is what is going to resonate most with most of the broader public. This is going to be their first and probably only um, exposure to marine aquaculture. Um, personal experiences in specific regional contexts are also really important to understand. So, for example, we know in the Gulf they have the BP oil spill, and so people may be hesitant to want any form of human production in the ocean um, just because they're still going to associate it with those uh, risks um, and, and maybe put a little bit heavier weight on the risks versus the potential benefits. Why do these things matter? Well, the truth is they can affect the ability for farms to obtain permits. They can also, even if the farm does get a permit, they can make it more costly and time consuming for them to do it. As you can imagine, this is not going to be very attractive to investors. It can affect the duration and severity of bad press in the wake of negative events. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it could also be that the public is only being exposed to these negative events, which is going to be that positive feedback cycle of them just hearing bad after bad after bad. Um, and it may also prevent aquaculture from becoming a priority in local, state, or national government. And this is really important because if we're looking to governments to help us build more consistency and strengthen that interagency collaboration so we can grow and expand marine aquaculture more efficiently, more safely, more responsibly, uh, it first has to become a priority in those local governments. And perceptions are going to be a key part of that because their constituents also have to want it. So. How do we tackle social license and perceptions issues? I think the first thing that we really need to take a step back and understand is consumer marketing versus education and outreach. Now, oftentimes if we talk about social license, social perceptions, it tends to get blurred with marketing. And I, pretty much every conversation I've ever had about this always somehow circles back to consumer marketing. And I can understand why people go there, but they are actually not the same. It's very important to distinguish. So marketing is key for consumers, getting people to eat and buy more seafood, right? And this is definitely a win. It's something we should all be striving for. We certainly support this. But if we're talking about getting that social license and that social acceptance to get farms permitted in the water, it's a different audience and it's a different approach. Um, so what we're talking about with education and outreach is really educating and engaging broader audiences, 
to garner that support, to expand their knowledge and exposure to marine aquaculture and what marine aquaculture is, regardless of the plan on actually buying and eating the seafood. Um, and then, of course, so these two strategies, they need to work in tandem, they need to work simultaneously. Um, you know, each effort has its strengths. Certainly the education and outreach can learn from the experience and, the, and benefit from the resources of the marketing side and vice versa. Um, it's also important for consistency. Some of these you know, key core messages are shared um, more accurately and more consistently across the board. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to stick to Education and outreach is necessary for garnering the support we need to permit a farm in the U.S. waters. And what this means is K-12 education. It means community outreach and engagement, stakeholder outreach and engagement, and also just broader public education and awareness. So who are the groups that we are trying to target? If it's not consumers, who is it? Well. Research has shown that the primary groups that tend to show up to comment or protest or you know, directly oppose, oppose specific projects tend to be environmental groups or concerned citizens or other resource users. So these could be fishermen, they could be other recreational users, divers, whale watchers, uh, recreational fishermen, um, uh, coastal homeowners also tend to fall into these categories. Um, these tend to be the loudest voices and they have a lot of resources, um, the monetary resources and also large followings. It's important to note that while all groups are important, all voices are important, uh, the groups that have these loudest voices and the most resources are not necessarily representative of the population at large or the great, what's the greater good for society and the environment. Uh, for example, some research has shown that some of the people most engaged, for example, in adopting sustainable seafood products, um, like the cards and the recommendation programs, or associated with some of these efforts to sign on to some of these broader environmental campaigns tend to be Caucasian, they tend to be upper middle class, they tend to be more educated, and they tend to be female. Uh, I fit into this category. I certainly view us as an important voice and one that should be taken seriously as with any voice, um, but we are certainly not representative of the population at large, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. And it's also important to understand that, you know, through the research that they've seen, if, if you look at public comments that come out in writing, um, you know, news articles that come out in opinion pieces, environmental concerns tend to dominate the rationale for opposition. However, what research has shown that while the environmental concerns is what they're putting out in the public space, um, for example, uh, UC Santa Barbara did a workshop many years ago with uh, commercial fishermen. And you know the commercial fishermen had come in saying, yeah, we're concerned about X, Y, and Z environmental issues. But once they dug deeper through the workshop, what they came to realize is at the heart of it, they were concerned about their livelihoods and that competition in the markets um, with the seafood. So it's really important to get down to the heart of what these concerns actually are versus what we are seeing on the surface. And it's a plug for my friends in the social science field, which I will plug throughout this talk, um, we need to fund more research. So for the purposes of this talk, let's focus on these groups through two different lenses, communities of place, which is your neighbors. So these would be indigenous groups, these would be in First Nations groups, these would be local homeowners, these would be local fishermen and other users. So if you're a farm, you're trying to seek a permit either for a new farm or to expand an existing farm, um, you know, these are the people who are going to be directly, potentially impacted, but di directly invested um, in this project. Whereas communities of practice, that's a bigger lens. So they could be local, but they could also be national or international. And this is going to include a lot of those NGOs um, and uh, the other resource users. So again, you've got fishermen and recreational users here, but the difference with this group, as opposed to the 
neighbors and communities of place is that these may be more of the fishing associations. Um, you know, they're going to have probably a lot more uh, resources at their disposal and much louder voices than the local guys on their own would have. So now let's move on to the, the what. what. What are the different types of issues that we're looking at? What are we trying to address with these different groups? And it's important to understand there's kind of two main categories that we want to look at here. The first is going to be tangible impacts. These are measurable impacts. They're going to have a, a baseline, a target that you can hit with numbers. You either make the numbers or you don't make the numbers. It's something that you can show through data. Um, if, if you're in compliance, these things could be water quality, it could be biodiversity, you could look at economic impacts and uh, relationships in the market. And then you have intangible impacts. And these are a lot tougher because they're not necessarily quantifiable. You can't necessarily put a number to them. So these include values, ideologies, uh, potential user conflicts, such as is it going to affect my livelihood? Um, and oftentimes, too, we see, you know, for environmental groups, they'll say they're concerned about disease, escapes, things of that nature. But the reality is they're really just concerned about any uh, activity, development activity in the ocean. They want the ocean to remain pristine and wild. Um, so these are a little bit of tougher issues to tackle, but they're not impossible to tackle. How do we tackle these issues? Um, so first, it's important to understand who should be taking a lead role and discussing what with these issues. So for the tangible impacts or the measurable impacts, it should really be the farmers in the government that are taking a lead role and really being transparent, open and honest about what the best management practices they're adopting for that specific farm that they're seeking permits for and why are they adopting them. Um, and as you'll see later, you should really tailor this to the priorities of the community with which you are engaging. Don't assume and go through a consistent list just because it's what we know as a community um, needs to be addressed. Um, you know, they also want to know the applicable laws and regulations. What, what are the rules and regulations that you are required as a farm, as a business in their community, in their backyard to follow? Um, of course, you want to prove that you're demonstrating, you know, you want to demonstrate that you're in compliance with these laws and regulations and hopefully going beyond. And, you know, one of the tools that conveying that you are demonstrating compliance, that you are in fact meeting your targets in a transparent way is certifications. Uh, the government also then helps and support with this because they can collect and they can share the data and compliance issue or compliance information. Um, we see this with, you know, government sites in Canada and Scotland. They've got some really great sites with the data from the farms. You can see sea lice treatments. You can see antibiotic use. You can see wildlife interactions. Um, and so the government could really collect and house this data and then share this data in an open format for the public to have access to. The government should also play a role in um, helping the public to understand the applicable um, laws and regulations as well. And then the NGOs and academics then provide that scientific evidence for the advocacy of the best management practices that are being adopted and the regulations. Um, and also it's important to provide context for that government and farm level data, because we know that the, the data is what the data is, but people can interpret it and take it and run with it how they want to. And we can never stop that. But what some of the uh, more scientific leaning NGOs and academics could do is um, at least provide some support for the efficacy of the data as it is and getting people to understand what that data actually means so that their imaginations don't run away with them if they see you know, peaks and valleys and don't quite understand what all that means. So for the intangible impacts, it's a little different. So from the farmers, what we want to see from them to address these issues are examples of participation in larger studies, so showing that you understand that there are broader implications for your activities of farming in the ocean. Um, some examples, uh, for example, Hog Island in California is working with the Nature Conservancy and UC Santa Cruz and UC Davis to better understand the interactions and relationships between oysters and eelgrass. Um, so these larger studies are going to be really important for people to understand that the farm, as farmers, you are 
also concerned citizens, you get it, and you want to understand these relationships and how they work as well and be a part then of those implementing those solutions. Um, you know, and then efforts outside of your operations to address these broader concerns for climate change, conservation, or user conflicts. Um, an example is in British Columbia, for example, a lot of salmon farming companies have invested also in the science for wild salmon. And so um, there are opportunities there. Um, in this case, the government um, can provide data information on the broader benefits and impacts of uh, marine aquaculture. Um, and then the NGOs and academics can also help provide that science-based evidence for the broader benefits and impacts to society and the environment. And again, providing that context for government and farm level data that is being provided in this space. But when it comes to who should take the lead, so as I mentioned with tangible impacts, it should really be the farmers and the government taking the lead on providing this information, right? It's the farmers who are implementing the best management. You're deciding what best management practice you are going to use in collaboration with government and in some cases in collaboration with the NGOs or the certification programs. But ultimately, it's your decision on, on which best management practices are adopted and why they're adopted. And um, so it should really be the farmers and the government agencies uh, in charge of regulating that should take the lead in engaging the public with these tangible impacts. And then again, the NGOs and academics play a supporting role, providing that backup information for the e efficacy of the science and the context. However, with intangible impacts, I would say we need to flip that, right? So it should be the NGOs and the academics that really need to take a proactive role in educating the public at large on the scientific evidence for the broader benefits and impacts to society and the environment. And then the, the farmers and the government then um, play a supporting role in providing that information through their own networks to their audiences. So now we're going to take a deeper dive into the communities of place. And as a reminder, these are your neighbors. These are the Indigenous and First Nations communities. These are local homeowners. These are local fishermen, local recreational users, divers, whale watching communities. Um, it's those groups that are going to be locally potentially affected and engaged in your uh, project, whether it be permitting for a new farm or the expansion of a farm or even just you know, regular existence. So one of the key things that exists throughout the literature for social license to operate, if you're looking at mining, if you're looking at blue economy, if you're looking at aquaculture, is building trust in these communities. And it's important to understand that trust is earned, trust is maintained over time. You don't just you know, work really hard to earn their trust and get the permit, you get the permit, and then you're done with it. It's, it's a journey. You have to keep going. Um, it's also a team sport. So if you are going out to get your permit, you could potentially be impacted or affected then though by whatever perceptions are left over from existing operations and vice versa. If you're a farm going out to get a permit and maybe you rub people the wrong way, another farm that is going to get a permit to expand their operations um, in the same vicinity or area or maybe elsewhere and it just happens to make national news, and, um, you know, these things can affect one another. So it's really important to understand that your efforts do not actually happen in a bubble. It is a team sport. Trust is earned and maintained by proactive and honest communications, uh, demonstrated ethical and responsible behavior or accountability, and active participation in the community and building relationships. So let's start with the communication piece. So communications, they should be proactive, they should be ongoing, and they should be tailored to the specific concerns and values of your target audience or your neighbors or your uh, community of place. 
So by proactive, what I mean is don't just wait for something to happen. Don't wait till you absolutely have to communicate. You should be communicating throughout the process. And this can, you know, if you're uh, going for a new permit, you should be communicating with those communities step by step as things go. If we've learned nothing else from the MPA process here in the US, we know that there were a lot of stakeholder groups who felt like decisions had already be made been made by the time that they were brought to the table. So it's really important to communicate early and to communicate often. Um, so again, keep those communications going throughout the process. Even if you don't have a farm in the water, as you're going to seek those permits, get those communications started as soon as you possibly can. Um, and they should be tailored to your specific concerns of your core audience. So in your community, jobs and economy may be a top priority, but it may not be. Um, in some communities, it may be addressing climate change and being a leader in climate resilience. In others, it could be wildlife interactions, potential whale entanglements is really big, for example, in the Northeast. So um, you wanna make sure that you're you know what those priorities and concerns are so that you can tailor your communications accordingly. And that's in that last point here of creating opportunities for two-way dialogues. So it's really important that your communication isn't just talking at them. You should be talking with them. You should be learning from them just as much as they are learning from you. It will help your communications be much more effective um, in, in the future. And then of course, being honest and transparent. And being honest, part of that is, you know, a lot of times we hear, and I don't I don't know that people need to do this, but oftentimes we hear people say, you know, our farm will have zero impact, or the research says that it has zero impact. Well, that's actually not true. There is no such thing as zero impact. Um, there is minimal impact. Um, there are trade-offs and relative impacts, um, but we know that anytime you are producing food, water, energy, uh, anytime you're adding infrastructure to the ocean environment, there will be risks. And we need to be honest about what those risks are, but also then be honest and transparent about what you're putting in place to address those risks. So the next item we want to look at is accountability. So this is throughout the literature. Again, it's pretty consistent through the the mining, the blue economy, the aquaculture, when you're talking about social license to operate. Accountability is a big piece of this. And so for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna break that out down into, as you can see, three different buckets. We've got the farm level, the government level, and the industry level. So at the farm level, you certainly wanna be, again, transparent. Part of that is just those open communications throughout the process, um, from, from permitting to operations throughout operations. You wanna demonstrate compliance with the laws. You wanna demonstrate ethical and responsible behavior. Um, and again, in the literature, certifications are listed as a potential tool to help demonstrate this compliance and this transparent behavior. The government level is also important here. So the public might trust the farm to do the right thing, but if they don't trust that that farm is adequately regulated, if they don't trust that the enforcement is adequate enough, what the farm does at the farm level may not be enough, especially if we're talking about farms that are trying to acquire permits and have not yet been operating. Um, so government accountability is also really key and important here, especially in the U.S. where, you know, we're just still trying to establish um, the sector. So again, you've got transparency, the two-way dialogue, which at the government level is baked right in because it is required for them to have those public comments periods. Um, consistency and interagency collaboration, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, this is going to be really key um, to garnering that public support and trust for the government's role and how effectively we can regulate and enforce this sector. And then the last one is industry itself. So, you know, you've got the seafood supply chain, the distributors, the people who are um, inspecting the health inspectors, there's a whole seafood supply chain that is also associated with this that may also affect whether or not the broader public trusts building another piece of that support system for the seafood supply chain um, in that area. So again, it's really important for transparency, demonstrating compliance of laws, demonstrating the ethical and responsible behavior. One thing that I've added here is addressing bad actors. Um, and I think it's really important to 
highlight that there's a difference between a, a, a bad actor and a good actor to which something tragic happens. So we know with the good actors, you know, things, again, you put infrastructure in the water, things can happen, um, but they're gonna take responsibility for it. They're gonna own it. They're going to be very clear and transparent about what they're gonna do to address it. And then they're gonna be able to demonstrate down the line they've actually implemented what they said they were going to do and whether or not that was adequate and worked. A bad actor, on the other hand, is going to start pointing fingers every which way, and whether or not they fix it, we don't know. Um, it's not likely going to be a super transparent process. Um, and the thing is, is the industry knows who these actors are better than anyone, and it's the industry who's taking the black eye more than anyone. Um, so I would think the industry would want to address this. Um, but I'm also not stating here or suggesting that you start a negative PR campaign against your rivals, right? And we saw this happen in Australia, for example, there was a bay where there were two salmon companies. One of them allegedly was dumping chemicals into the, uh, the bay. So the other one did publicly uh, denounce them for doing it, and it ended up biting them because the local chefs in the area then said, well, then we're not buying farm salmon from anyone in that bay. Um, so I certainly don't recommend a public witch hunt um, for these bad actors. I'm just suggesting that perhaps the industry can find ways to hold those bad actors accountable. And you know, if after some effort, um, they cannot get them to comply and meet that minimum bar of, of standards, um, figuring out a way to get them out of there. So building relationships is also really important to building the trust within these communities of place. So the, the first one again is accountability. Just be a good neighbor and demonstrate the ethical and responsible behavior. And again, this is something we should all be doing anyway. Um, communication, once again, be transparent, be honest, that two-way dialogue, again, don't just speak at the community, but speak with them, learn from them, um, get to know them and their concerns and meet them where they are. Uh, and that proactive engagement, again, just don't wait for something to happen or until you need to communicate with them. You should be communicating with them proactively throughout the life of your project. Participation. Um, so you should also be building relationships with Indigenous and uh, First Nations communities. Um, and again, don't wait until you're required to do so in the public commenting period. Uh, you should probably start this sooner rather than later. And again, this is something you should be building over time and over the duration of your farm's existence. Donate product. This is something that a number of farms do throughout the U.S. and wild capture fisheries as well. Uh, even during COVID, we've seen them donating to local food banks. Um, I know that there are a number of salmon farms out there that will donate to you know, local soccer clubs and community events and things of that nature. Um, and then also participating in community events. So don't just donate food, but actually show up and be a part of it, whether they be you know, local festivals or you know, school events or things of that nature. Um, if it's a community event and it's appropriate for you to participate, it could go a long way in garnering that trust and support and supporting other community interests. Um, and of course, you know, different farms are going to have different levels of capacity to do this. And that's really important to understand. So then we want to move out to communities of practice. So again, these are going to be be much louder, much more, these guys are going to have much more resources. Um, these guys may come from local levels, but they're also going to be attached to national and potentially even international um, voices. So these are your NGOs. These are fishermen, but more on the side of fishermen associations. So these guys may be brought in to help amplify the concerns of the local fishermen and the communities of place. And then again, those recreational users, again, also could be brought in as the larger associations to kind of amplify those local voices, or in some cases, they're not attached to local interests at all. They just more broadly don't want these things to occur um, in U.S. waters. So 
Of course, the trust building exercises of the communities of place is going to be really critical here. And by building that trust, by engaging with your local community, you're actually going to make it a lot harder than for some of these communities of practice who are opposing these projects to come in and chip away at um, you know, your neighbor's perceptions about your farm. So if you've built that goodwill, if you've educated them about what you're doing, they're going to have uh, more of a foundation to build from and more of that confidence to say, well, you know, that's actually not true or, you know, that's not my understanding of this project when these groups come in and try to um, paint a negative picture. So communities of practice, they tend to be more concerned with the issues associated again with those broader values and ideologies, those intangible issues, those ones that we can't really quantify. It's important to be realistic about the potential to change hearts and minds here. You need to know when to walk away. Um, any shifts in attitude among these groups are likely going to take a long time and significant investment. They're not going to do a 180. And collaborative multi-stakeholder outreach is, is going to be really critical here. Um, I would contend that it's going to be a long process, but I think you need peer-to-peer -peer relationships here. So, for example, with the fishermen, I think we need a stronger community of fishermen allies that we can get to speak directly to those fishermen and start building the relationship that way. Um, with the NGOs, it should be NGO to NGO. Um, so we still got a lot of work to do in that area, but it definitely has to be an all hands on deck situation to make this work. So for engaging communities of practice, you know, one of the main things is don't go toe to toe. You know, if they come out in the community and they amplify, you know, X, Y, and Z risks, and then, you know, the proponents of aquaculture then come out and address X, Y, and Z risks um, point for point, in a lot of ways, what you're really doing is just keeping those risks at the forefront in the general public's mind. Again, the public doesn't really know a lot about aquaculture, and so by these groups kind of putting the risks first, and, you know, up front and center, um, and then you know the proponents come in and say, well, here's how we address X, Y, and Z risks. Um, it's just the risks keep getting put back to the top of the list instead of focusing on what we should be focusing on, which is here's why marine aquaculture has greater benefits to society and the environment. Um, and then, of course, going back to communities of place, then you can start to tackle the specific risks and the best management practice that you're going to apply and things of that nature. But if we're talking about the bigger messaging to the communities that is going on with some of these groups, going to toe-to-toe -to -toe may not always be um, the best strategy and it may not always yield the best results. We need to emphasize, again, those messages that address the values and, and the ideologies. Again, it's those this bigger picture, how does marine aquaculture contribute to benefits for society and the environment at large? Meeting your audience where they are. You know, again, if, if jobs and livelihoods and economics are not their priority, what is their priority and what should you be focusing on? What should your key messages be? Um, and also just not attacking, right? So if your audience is genuinely concerned about a risk or issue and you know, the proponents understand based on the science that this is not really a risk or issue because we have ways to address it. Be patient and try to find a way to educate them and to get them on the same page without attacking and just telling them that they are wrong. Investing in broader education and outreach efforts, um, of course, is going to be really important. And this has to be an ongoing effort that happens at all levels. So we know that there are farms, for example, that are going for permits. We should certainly be concentrating in those areas for that broader education outreach, but we should also be having more national and regional um, outreach and education campaigns that are ongoing. And then we need to build stronger relationships and collaborations, again, with proponents from the NGO and academic sectors. So, as I've mentioned throughout the presentation, when most of the public is a blank slate with marine aquaculture. And the fortunate thing is, is we have an opportunity with appropriate outreach and education to get them on board. The unfortunate thing is it also means they are much more susceptible to being influenced by negative 
attention that comes through, say, the mainstream media or trusted groups that they tend to follow on social media. And the issue with this is, you know, it, we see a lot of industry on industry um, finger pointing. And so, you know, there have been, for example, a lot of really great articles that have come in mainstream media. They're supposed to be more pro aquaculture. A lot of times they focus on seaweed and shellfish, and that's not a bad thing. Those are very great products that we need to celebrate and we need to push forward. The problem is though, in a lot of these articles, what we're seeing is they then immediately throw fin fish under the bus, or you'll see something on a recirculating system that's gonna throw offshore on, under the bus. And in doing this, it's not really a helpful exercise because you have a public now that is just getting confused. And again, you know, as I mentioned before, with the risk, if you go toe to toe with the risk, even if you're showing that it can be addressed in the public side, all you're doing is keeping those risks kind of front and center at the top of the, the media food chain. Um, and the same thing goes with finger pointing. Instead of getting people to understand the value of aquaculture and what it could provide to this society at large, they're also seeing then, well, this kind of aquaculture is good, this is bad, this is just too confusing, I'm going to walk away. And it's not really a win for anybody. The reality is from a broader benefit to society and the environment, there is room for all of these systems. In fact, we need all of these systems. You know, the reality, for example, with shellfish and seaweed and fin fish, when it comes to displacing our red meat consumption, um, of which I've already demonstrated we eat a lot, finfish is going to play a much bigger role in that. And we do know that finfish can be done responsibly. Now, it is at the, the gold standard like seaweed and shellfish in terms of those ecosystem benefits. Maybe not, but it still does have a unique benefit that shellfish and seaweed can't yet provide because it's not yet in demand the way that fin fish could be on the on the consumption side. You know, closed systems and net pens, we know they have trade-offs as well. Obviously, net pens all start with a closed system, uh, but in terms of the resource use, the energy intensity, um, they're very different. And, and if we're talking about meeting the demand for seafood in a landlocked state, fully closed containment system makes a lot of sense. But if we're talking about a coastal state like California, where we're prone to droughts, where we have fires that knock out energy grids, a system reliant completely on those closed systems may not be the best option. So we have to be realistic about the, the trade-offs and benefits and understanding that all of these systems are going to play a valuable role. So now that we know what social license is, we know the impacts, we know that we need broader education and outreach, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, it does have to be collaborative. Um, again, we need all hands on deck here. We need the farms, we need the government, we need the NGOs, the universities, the aquariums, you name it, everything but the kitchen sink. We need industry, um, the supply side, the retailers, the chefs, all, all hands on deck. We also need to get better collectively at telling the story. So we need to humanize not just the farmers, but also the scientists who are involved, the chefs, again, throughout that supply chain. But we need to put a face to the practice. It's much easier to throw stones at a faceless industry than it would be to actually look someone in the eye and, and make some of these claims. We also need to familiarize people with what marine aquaculture is and what it looks like. You know, here at the aquarium, we had, uh, you know, an adult education series where we featured aquaculture and we asked them, what is it that you want to know? And, you know, they all know what a chicken or a dairy farm looks like, but none of them knew what marine aquaculture looks like. They couldn't visualize it in their head. So it's really critical that we get people to understand, you know, hey, wh where are these farms located? You know, what are, what species are they farming? And what do they look like? What, you know, if we say that they're farming yellowtail offshore or they're farming mussels on lions or they're farming oysters and wrecks, what does this mean and what does it look like? And help them visualize that. And some invaluable tools that we have to do that are farm tours. Um, so there are a number of farmers out there and thank you very much to those of you who do this or have the bandwidth or capacity to do this, but farm tours are worth their weight in gold. Just that tangible experience of getting people out there and actually getting to see it with their own eyes to interact and engage with the farmers is a extremely valuable exercise in terms of engaging the broader public and garnering that public goodwill and support. 
um, short of having a farm of our own, the aquarium also has some exhibits and trying to engage them and, and get them to start to visualize what these things look like, but there is no substitute for actually getting them out there. But also understanding that not every farm is going to be able to do this. It does require a lot of time and it does require a lot of resources. Um, but those farms that are able, I think we need to find ways collectively as a community to support them um, and make those programs successful. Um, and then, of course, if you can't provide farm tours or even if you can and you want to supplement that, you could do presentations at local events and venues, for example, at the Aquarium of the Pacific or at local farmers markets, at local fairs, things of that nature. So in order to execute this, though, we do need to invest. We need to invest, again, that social science to better understand these, these issues associated with perceptions and concerns, to better understand those communities of place and also those communities of practice so that we can be more effective in engaging them. We need to invest more in K through 12 education. The children are, after all, our future. Uh, community engagement and outreach and stakeholder engagement and outreach and specifically for stakeholders we still need we have a lot of work to do with policy makers with regulators even with our peers in the aquarium world um, and science writers are a really important group that we need to do a better about the job of engaging with um, and then journalists and a number of other stakeholders so just to show you that it is not impossible to move the needle on perceptions this is a snapshot of a survey that was conducted to evaluate our Ocean to Table series. So our Ocean to Table series was a video series featuring five farms around the U.S. in collaboration with, it was funded by NOAA um, USC Sea Grant, and it was in collaboration with Sea Grant NOAA um, Seafood Nutrition Partnership and a number of other partners. And the idea behind these videos was to humanize the farmers, to show the connection between the farming and the science, and then to familiarize people with, you know, A, what the farms look like, and we also wanted to familiarize them with how to cook the seafood, so there was a little bit of a culinary element to it. So what this survey did then was once we created the videos, uh, they had then had you see the pre-test and the post-test. So they had to answer some baseline questions and then they had to watch the video and then they post-test had to answer the questions again. And as you can see, we moved the needle quite a bit in terms of improving those views or perceptions of marine aquaculture pre and post watching the video. And keep in mind, this was a very general uh, public that we had targeted through these surveys. Um, so it's not impossible to move the needle, and this was just after watching one video. The challenge here is getting the right people to watch the video. Um, you know, these, these participants were actually paid to contribute to this survey, which meant they didn't get their money unless they actually watched the video and finished the survey. Um, getting a broader public that knows little to nothing about aquaculture to then click on the link for a video about aquaculture is easier said than done. So what are some of the things that we've been doing at the aquarium specifically to address public perceptions? We have been busy. So as I mentioned earlier, you saw kind of an older exhibit we had on marine aquaculture, and that was since replaced with our Pacific Visions wing. And so that whole wing focuses on, again, meeting the needs of a growing population in a changing climate while reducing our impacts. And it really focuses on the development of food, water, and energy. And marine aquaculture is playing a starring role um, throughout the wing um, as one of the potential solutions. So it's featured very heavily in the theater as one of the food solutions. And then in our culmination gallery, it is in the interactives. And then all three live animal exhibits actually relate to uh, marine aquaculture. And the beauty of that is we, we have hired a consultant to evaluate the efficacy of these messages. And what she found was that People were very receptive and open to the idea of marine aquaculture as a sustainable source of protein in the future. So that's good news. Um, we also have our websites and our, our story map. So um, our story map, again, we wanted to familiarize people with where these farms are located and kind of get a general sense of what they look like. Um, so this is just one tool that provides an avenue to do that. 
We also have our storied seafood project. Now the two stories or the two pieces that exist net currently are wild capture. However, we are working on a US marine aquaculture piece that will come out in fall of 2020, probably very late fall, <laughs> early winter. But that will enable us to, you know, kind of story bank, if you will, some of these great existing stories that already exist again to humanize and familiarize people with what marine aquaculture is. And we will be in touch with many of you in the near future to start to aggregate some of the great stories that you guys are already telling that we can include on that website. So videos, you know, as I mentioned, we have a number of videos that we created over the years, including our Ocean the Table series. And we have a fun animation series that was done with the Arts Center College of Design. Some of those animations are 30 seconds or less, so they're great for social media. There are fish story, which tends to be popular. It's about a 10 minute kind of video on marine aquaculture. And then you go to our YouTube channel and find many, many more, including a 20 minute video we did on US marine aquaculture. We have a couple of other animated shorts put together by our own AV team. So lots of stuff, lots of resources there. Uh, K through 12 education. So we did just put in an application for funding to turn a module we just created into a format that's conducive to being published on the PBS Learning Media, which would enable us then to reach potentially hundreds of thousands of educators. Uh, that particular module is a little unique in that a lot of the education content that currently exists for aquaculture is usually built around building your own aquaponics project and then the students get to learn and look at the quantifiable measurable pieces of aquaculture and growing your own fish and growing your own sea vegetables. Um, but what this would do is put it in the context of the broader food supply in the changing climate. So it just provides a, a little bit of a different context. And then with our Ocean to Table series, uh, we're still waiting on an education module that was supposed to accompany that as well. So we do have our stakeholder newsletter. Um, some of you may be familiar with our U.S. Marine Aquaculture Communications Toolkit. In August, we will be switching that over to our Marine Aquaculture Science Spotlight. So if you're already subscribed to the toolkit, essentially it's just going to switch you over automatically. Um, if you're not a fan, you're feel free to unsubscribe. But the idea was really to hone in on the peer-reviewed science. And we really kind of, it's, so, so it's a stakeholder newsletter. It's geared for all stakeholders, but the primary audience that we're really trying to tailor this to legislative staffers, um, agency staffers, and uh, science writers. But it, it certainly is a useful tool for all stakeholders who are interested in learning from a high level of view the state of the science for marine aquaculture. And hopefully, just as we were trying to do with the US Marine Aquaculture Toolkit, the same idea applies in just trying to connect you with the state of the current science to help inform your communications efforts so that your communications with your audiences can remain more consistent with the state of the science and more accurate. So we have also our public lecture series at the aquarium. You can go to aquariumpacific.org, check out our lecture series. We have amazing lectures on all kinds of topics from the cute fuzzies and pictures of critters and photographers to researchers. Um, we've covered coral reefs, we've covered blue economy. Uh, marine aquaculture is one of those topics that we have covered a number of times, both by um, regular lectures and also panel discussions. So please do visit aquariumpacific.org and check out our lecture series and look for our aquaculture content. And that actually includes a social researcher who is far more qualified than I to talk about this. Um, so he just recorded a lecture for us and that should be on the lecture landing page, um, Dr. Luke Fairbanks from University of Mississippi. Um, what I'm really excited about is a new limited virtual panel series that we will be launching this fall. The series will be based on a paper called Reframing the Sustainable Seafood Narrative. It was two of its co-authors and many co-authors, Dr. Michael Slusty of University of Massachusetts and Dr. Peter Tidmares of Bellhousie University. 
in Canada um, will be joining us along with Robert Jones from the Nature Conservancy to discuss that paper and then also the application of some of these broader um, these broader topics in the real world. And then the series will basically build out from there and it will include a social license uh, module. So we will have a social license discussion again with researchers who are far more qualified than I to speak on this topic. So we hope that you will join us for that when those become available in the fall. So thank you for taking the time for tuning in. Um, you know, as I mentioned, addressing social perceptions and social license is a team sport. It's going to take all hands on deck and, you know, we look forward to engaging with as many of you as are interested um, to start to tackle this really complex problem and start to move the needle toward more positive reception for responsible marine aquaculture development in the U.S. and abroad. Thank you very much.